confirm that the committee is holding um, the meeting and um, we're now live. And anybody um, who's using Starleaf, um, if they could put it in the chat, if you're not, you know, um, just try and indicate to myself or Emer and we'll try and catch your eye. Um, Emer, how many, I mean, I've received two apologies from Jerry Carl and Nicola Brogan. Are there any others at this stage? No. Joanne Gamble. Sorry, Tom. Jo jo Joanne Gamble, apology for Joanne. She's, she's Joanne Bunting. <laughs> Bunting, yeah, whatever, yeah. <laughs> okay, ahead. thanks, Tom. I'll record that for Joanne to make sure that that's noted. So, um, on the 3rd of November, um, the meeting, the Minister meeting are on page five of our packs. So he's content to note or agree these, these minutes. Okay, so that's agreed. Um, and pages 11 is a correspondence from the chairperson of the House of Commons Procedures Committee, formally requesting for to a visit to the assembly and to meet with our committee in order to inform their inquiry into the procedure of the house of commons and the territorial constitution we previously agreed to meet with the westminster procedures committee and officials so we'll now begin to make the appropriate arrangements and suitable dates and times to meet the chairperson has also requested a meeting with the speaker and a chair of Parliament Buildings. So members can tend to note this correspondence, this item of correspondence. Agreed, okay. At page 12 is a draft response from the ERA committee regarding the possibility of establishing a standing committee with a specific agreement to oversee climate change policy. The committee considered ERA's correspondence at its meeting on the 3rd of November and agreed for a draft response to be brought back to today's meeting. But given the complexity of this issue, the response is very detailed. But in essence, the, the draft response will state that the committee has not had a discussion or has not discussed or taken a view on the subject matter of the proposed Stanton Committee and has confined its response to the questions of feasibility and procedural steps, which would be required should the Assembly agree to support such a development. So we're just sticking to the factually correct response. So our members happy to agree that? Okay. Um, agenda item four, our private members bills, PMBs, and the oral evidence that we'll receive today. So with Dr. Kiva Archibald um, first, and you may remember that we received oral evidence from Claire Bailey on her experience of the PMB process in the assembly. So Dr. Kiva Archibald and Jim, Mr. Jim Mollister have kindly agreed to provide evidence on their experiences and views also. At page 18 of our PAC, Emer has provided us with a note regarding the committee's inquiry into PMBs and a summary of the responses received to date. Also, members will have received table papers for today's meeting, which include responses to the committee's terms of reference from the Business Committee at page three of our table pack and from the CLG, page seven of our table pack. So I'm just seeking your consent to note that correspondence received from both CLG and the Business Committee. And he's, both con and he's also content to, for both of today's oral evidence sessions to be recorded by Hansard. Agreed, okay. So without further ado, I wanna welcome Dr. Kevo Archibald to today's meeting. Um, and Kiva, I just want to thank you for taking the time to um, give your opinions to this committee. So without further ado, Kiva, I'm going to pass it over to yourself. Um, thanks, Chair, and I'm very much in your hands as to, to what you um, want um, from me today. But I have, I guess, some initial comments to make, and then I'm happy to take any questions that you have as well. Um, so. I'm going to give, I guess, my perspective from how we dealt with PMDB by the committee. And then I can also offer just views and I'm bringing forward a PMB of my own. So I have, I have that perspective of it as well. So what we have been doing so far, we've actually only received one um, PMB 
to committee stage. So that, that is John, o Bill, John O'Dowd's bill on small scale green energy. So we are going through um, our call for evidence at the minute. Um, and that has been done by a citizen space. It's, it's what's being used for PMBs across the um, assembly at the minute. Um, and that has worked very well for us as well in terms of um, the, the bill we have just finished. It, it was a parental bereavement leave bill brought through by, by the economy minister, but it was a very, um, very useful tool for, um, for getting that evidence and getting those responses in via the surveys. Um, so we have that one bill, and as I say, we are taking our evidence at the minute. We're doing our oral sessions, and the, the survey is ongoing. We are expecting a number of additional private members' bills in the next short space of time. Um, two have already been introduced, one by Rachel Woods and one by Jen Madolan. We're expecting one from Jerry Carroll very shortly, and then at least another two or three within quite a short space of time. So for us, it's going to be a very um, difficult balancing act in terms of getting all of those through and doing the, the degree of scrutiny that you would want to be able to do on any bill. Um, as I say, we're using citizen space to collect the um, evidence for the committee's scrutiny. And at the minute, we are having that open for four weeks. So the serve, people can respond to the surveys for four weeks. Likely in the... In the um, forthcoming bills, that's probably going to have to be shortened just to allow us to, to get through what we need to get through. Um, obviously, we all know that this has been a, a very shortened mandate and a lot of PMBs are coming through at the one time and that really is going to put pressure on us as a committee in terms of the scrutiny that we get to do on each one of those individual, but also in terms of timetabling um, that work and getting the kind of oral sessions of evidence that you would want to, and we might not be able to, to do that um, to the extent that we would like to do on each one of the, the bills. And the bills that are being brought forward, they're, they're around very topical issues, like Rachel Wood's bill is on domestic safe or domestic abuse safe leave. Jamina Dolan's bill is to ban zero hour contracts. You know, they're, they're topics that um, will generate a lot of interest and that there will be people wanting to respond to and that you would want to give the fullest possible scrutiny to. Um, and we will be doing that in terms of it, to the ability that we, we can do. Um, so I guess that's it in, in line of initial comments, um, Chair, but happy to, to be led by yourself in terms of any additional views that you want um, as well. Okay, well, listen, say it does. Kiva, thanks very much for that. Um, at this stage, um, I'm going to throw it open to members, and I may I even just ask you about your own um, PMB as well. So um, I'll just leave it over, over to members if anybody wants to ask any specific questions. Emer, can you see? Oh, there's Tom, are you? Yes, Tom, away you go. Yes. Emer, just with so, or sorry, with so many of uh, private members' bills coming through at this moment in time, and you've, out, you've outlined uh, quite a number that's coming through, uh, you know, surely it's not going to be possible to give them the scrutiny that they really deserve. And therefore, is it wise to uh, push, to have so many private members' bills coming through where the proper scrutiny is not going to be given to them? And we always know that whenever the proper scrutiny is not given to a bill, then it can produce bad legislation. Is one of the things that we don't want. So what is your thoughts actually on that particular issue of too many bills being actually squeezed in to the short time frame that we have, not enough scrutiny, and maybe the, then uh, on the offshot of that where we have uh, produced legislation that's not really up to standard? So, as I said, we all recognise we're in a shortened mandate and we've had a limited time to bring forward bills, but obviously as well we are a legislative assembly, so it is, you know, it is uh, for us to bring forward legislation. We will give it the fullest possible scrutiny that we can, and, and as a committee chair, um, I, I obviously will be playing my role in, in that. Um, we do have the, the citizen space tool to be able to, to collect the evidence via the surveys. Um, we will be challenged in terms of, of timetabling for oral sessions. 
I, I very much anticipate that we will be looking at two committee sessions per week um, to, to give the, um, the detailed scrutiny that we'll need to do on, on those bills. Um, and obviously, we do want members to have the opportunity to progress their legislation to the fullest extent that they can. And certainly, I will be facilitating that in my role as a chairperson of a committee as, as much as I possibly can. Um, thank you, Kiva. I mean, see from your own experience, um, what, I mean, your own perspective, what areas do you feel that could be improved um, when members are going through their own individual PMBs? So, um, and I, I had a bit of a think about this, um, Carl, obviously in, in advance of today. And um, I, I guess in terms of the process, it is, it is quite complex um, in terms of, you know, what you need to do at each stage to progress it. Um, it has taken time, obviously, to, to get to the point my, my bill is, is just at the point where it's going to be drafted. Um, and obviously, it has been through its consultation and, and all of that. But that has taken a number of months. Um, and it is, as I've reflected in terms of, obviously, there are, are a number of private members' bills all coming along at once. So obviously, there is pressure on, on the... the um, on the, the resources that are, are there. Um, and in a normal mandate, that might be spread out better over the course of the five years. So um, I'm, I'm quite uh, pragmatic about it in terms of um, I'm keen to see my legislation progress. If, if it doesn't get finalized in this mandate, I'm hopeful then that it, it could be carried forward to the next mandate. And I imagine a lot of people will be in the of the same view that it's, it's getting it progressed as much as possible and getting where we can legislation on the books, but where, where that's not possible, that we advance it to the degree that we can and we hopefully we'll be able to pick it up in the next mandate. Thank you for that, Kiva. Is there anyone else seeking yeah, questions? Uh, Carl, could I? Uh, yes, Kira's after you, Rosemary. Yes, go ahead. Um, Kiva, just wanted to ask, as you know, in the previous um, presentation we had uh, two weeks ago, in relation to the consultation process for your own for the private members bill, how did how did you feel about that, um, and what support, if any, were you were you given, and was there a cost involved for you personally? There was no cost involved for for me personally. We did that by a survey monkey, so we put out the um, consultation survey but very proactively as well reached out to the relevant stakeholders um, to the, the kind of legislative area that, that my bill is in um, and talked to as many of those as possible, set up uh, Zooms with um, the various groups and organisations to talk to them, found that a very, very useful process. Um, so certainly I, I see the, the, uh, the actual uh, physical consultation document uh, as one part of it, but the talking to, to people about the bill and what you wanted to do and what you think it will do and hearing their views was every bit as important as if, if not more so in terms of um, bringing things forward and developing it and, and, and even understanding how people saw um, what you were doing that has fitting into their work. So I, I very much, if I was given advice to anybody about um, their legislation, it would be to have that that actual face-to-face uh, -face engagement with people where possible. And that obviously supports the, the consultation survey then that you will be bringing forward as well. Thank you. Thank you, Kara. Sorry, Rosemary, would you like to come in now? You're okay. Yeah, um, I'm just coming from a women's caucus meeting just just before this meeting and we're looking at ways of improving representation from women in Stormont. Now what Kiva said and Kiva this is not a criticism of you but a criticism in general you know the number of bills coming through you talked about two committee meetings per week etc etc that does not bode well for people with young families, family life, et cetera, et cetera. And I think fine to bring forward these bills, but there's got to be some sort of 
thought mechanism given to other issues also? Can I respond to that, Chair? Yes, yes. certainly. Um, so, yeah, and I think we all, uh, as MLAs, recognise the, uh, the extent of our work and the, um, the difficulty and balance in everything in terms of our assembly role and our constituency role, and then obviously trying to have some sort of work-life balance outside of that. So it's a constant juggling um, of responsibilities, and I, I, I think that um, that's the case for, from, from anybody's perspective. Obviously, it's, it's more difficult when you have care and responsibilities as well. Um, I would see the, the scheduling of the two committee um, meetings a week as a, as a necessity at this stage in the mandate because we are um, trying to progress as much legislation as we can um, and the committee will hopefully try to facilitate that. Um, and, and, and as chairperson, I, I will be encouraging that we do facilitate that. But obviously, people are bound by the amount of time that they can spend on, on any one thing. And, and certainly, as a, as a reflected, I think that over the course of a normal mandate, that um, we, we should seek to try and spread out um, PMBs a bit uh, more and so that we aren't in the position where um, we have so many coming through right at the very end. Obviously, there's all, always um, a degree of uh, um, a rush to, to complete legislation at the end of, a, of, a, of the mandate and you know, timetabling and late nights are, are, I guess, to be expected to an extent as we're trying to finalise things. But I think it would be useful if we could in some way try to, um, to spread the, the, the workload of the PMBs over the course of a mandate. Yeah, can I can I just uh, come back, Kiva? There, of course. Of course. I, I understand what you're saying, but I sit on the DERA committee. We have already extended our workload into the afternoon on Thursday, as you're possibly aware. On the Thursday afternoon, you might get you might get half the committee. And to me, that is not proper scrutiny. If you're only getting half a committee and you, you have the full committee in the morning, you have only half the committee for the second half of the day or maybe for the second committee later on in the week, that is, there are problems there. Yes, and, and Rosemary, I, I guess what I, I would say in, in respect of that is this is our intention Obviously, we'll have to see how it works out in practice. Um, it is very much dependent on the cooperation of your MLAs. And, and uh, as it says, we all have an awful lot of demands on our time. Yeah. Um, so we, we have the intent that we will um, facilitate as much legislation as we can. Um, and as I say, I'll try my best to do that. But obviously, you know, we, we are bound by what, what we can actually manage to fit in and what people can actually manage to fit in. So yeah. certainly I take on board what your, your points and in actual fact, I think it's very useful to reflect on. And certainly I'll have a discussion with, with my committee clerk around that because I, it is important that we have as many members contributing to that scrutiny as possible. So that's something for us to take on board as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rosemary. Thank you, Kira, and thank you, Tom. Are there any other questions for Kiva? I can't see any. So, um, Kiva, thank you very much for appearing at the committee today. And I'm sure you'll feel that it's been fairly useful in terms of even getting some of that feedback. And I wish you well in your endeavours as committee chair, as well as an individual, bringing your private members bill forward. So. Good luck, Kevin. Thank you again. And if, you, and if you don't mind, if there are any other perhaps follow-up questions um, that are required, we could even just write out to you if it's not too much hassle. Is yep. that okay? Thank you very much. Thanks, Thank Kate. Bye-bye. Thank you. Um, so, um, Mr. Jim Mallister was originally due to give his oral evidence at the end of, of the agenda, but Due to a change um, in the time for a ministerial briefing at the Finance Committee, which you know, is, is what it is, um, the agenda, this agenda item has been brought forward. Um, Mr. Alistair will be joining us today to provide oral evidence of his experience of a private member's bill. Um, and can I refer you to um, Emer's um, paper or the paper that Emer's provided us at page 19? 
And Mr Alistair has kindly supplied us with a written submission at pages or page 27 of our pack. So without further ado, um, Mr Alistair, you're very welcome um, at today's Procedures Committee and thank you for taking time with us this afternoon. So I'm just going to pass it over to yourself. Thank you. Thank you uh, for the opportunity um, to share my experience. Uh, I suppose I have the experience of, of steering two, bill, two private members' bills through the House, one in which I sat on the Scrutiny Committee and one in which I didn't. And certainly from the perception of the bill sponsor, uh, being on the committee was a much more satisfactory experience. Now, of course, it's not all about the interests of the bill sponsor, but I think that is an important consideration. And from my experience, the advantages of that were these, that you were able, as the questions arose about the bill, more often than not, to swiftly answer the point and maybe cause the committee avoid the committee going down a rabbit hole about something that the bill wasn't really about, or to see that there was a need to make some adjustment or amendment to deal with a point which had been properly raised. Uh, and again, I think that was time-saving. Uh, as a sponsor, it was advantageous to be able to ask the questions of the witnesses uh, that maybe other members of the committee who weren't as across the actual detail of the bill were perhaps, if I might put it, I guess, missing. I remember during my first bill when I wasn't on the committee watching it and thinking, well, why doesn't somebody ask such and such? Uh, if you're actually there and you can ask the question, it's, it's a much more beneficial experience. So from my perception, I felt that being on the committee uh, and of course, I'm only I'm talking. If you're on the committee fully, that's fine. But I'm only talking about having speaking rights, not voting rights. But spe speaking rights to include the posing of questions to witnesses. I think provided a much more satisfactory and comprehensive experience than uh, being on the outside of that process. And I don't think it did any damage to the process. I think it did rather uh, enhance it. So I would be strongly in favour of any bill sponsor uh, at the, uh, having the option of being on the committee during the scrutiny of their bill. Uh, and my experience would, would, would produce only positive uh, vibes about that. The other point I wanted to comment on in your terms of reference, if I might, uh, the suggestion that there should be some sort of filter or sift before a bill should be allowed to be drafted, I, I think that would be a very retrograde step. I think a bill can only be properly evaluated when you see it in its actual form. And I think there would be a danger of either a knee-jerk or an ill-considered rejection of an idea uh, if there was some sort of sift at an earlier stage uh, where an idea might not got, get all the consideration it deserved uh, because, in part, it hasn't been fully articulated as to what it actually means within uh, legislative terms. Uh, so I think that would be a very retrograde step. And I think also in a house where backbenchers are, are the users of uh, private member facilities in terms of bringing bills, and in a house where you have a couple of very large dominant parties, you wouldn't want really to create a situation where the big brigade could simply suppress issues at the earliest possible stage. I think uh, being a legislator entitles uh, and a quality of opportunity uh, to bring a proposal, have it judged on its merits, and you can only judge it on its merits when you actually see uh, the cold print of the proposal, not when it's in a more elusive uh, form of an idea, which would stand the risk of never getting off the ground. Thank you, thank you for that. Um... So, I mean, I suppose you've partly answered my question, Mr. Alistair, about areas where you feel improvements could be made in the whole process. Um, and just to say, you know, just to have it on the record, as a member of one of the big parties, I'm completely against censorship. Um, we're here 
to legislate and whatever form that legislation is made, preferably it's made by the executive, but if it's not, then there are gaps. We're all entitled to bring that legislation forward. But are there other areas that you haven't mentioned that you feel improvements could be made to make this process a lot easier for bill sponsors in particular? Well, again, uh, the two bills that I successfully brought through had different genesis. The first mm-hmm. one was drafted with the assistance by the, uh, the Legislative Council through the Bills Office. It was, I suppose, very complex in, in its nature, and that was very useful. And I have nothing but praise for that process, other than perhaps that it was slower than one would have liked. Uh, but one does understand there are competing, uh, there are pressures on resources. The second bill I brought, I drafted myself, uh, and um, that um, meant that I suppose I was able to fast track some of the issues and avoid Mm -hmm. some of the delays. But uh, I think it probably within the bills office comes down to a question of the adequacy of funding. Uh, And it's pretty clear at the moment there's a there's an avalanche of private members' bills. And uh, I think the one thing we should all be glad of is that we don't work in the bills office because it must be very pressured indeed to get all these bills through. But I think making sure that the bills office is adequately resourced is a very important component uh, to facilitating private members' registration. I think there could also be a greater flexibility of access for the private member to the Office of Legislative Council. That role is very jealously preserved by the executive to themselves. And yet, if you bring a private member's bill, and there are issues in the drafting of it that the OLC would do differently, I mm-hmm. think there would be an advantage in the OLC having the flexibility to come to you and say, well, in fact, we see what you want to do. We're not trying to change what you want to do, but here's a better way of doing it. I think that would be uh, an assistance to the process. So I do say that the um, Office of Legislative Council, which I presume is under the Executive Office, technically, Mm -hmm. uh, that some greater liberation of them to be able to help, uh, not to do the work for, but to give some pointers and guidance to a private member uh, might be of assistance. So I I agree, um, but the Office of Legislative Council is paid for by executive ministers, so that's probably why there's a bit of um, shading going on there, but certainly in terms of additional resources for the Bills Office. Um, is something that has come up time and time again. But I'm going to thank you, Mr. Alster. I'm going to pass it open to mem- over to members to ask questions. Um, so if anybody would like to indicate, um, I'd be happy to if have any questions. Tom, yourself, go ahead. Thank you, and thank you, Jim, for your uh, for coming and uh, speaking to us today about the private members' bills. You have obviously brought forward a couple of bills uh, in different aspects, one where you were on committee, one where you weren't on committee and hadn't got the, the speaking rights on it, as you have outlined. What part of the process have you found to be the most challenging whenever you've been bringing forward uh, the private members' bill? Well, I suppose the most challenging, in a way, is getting the legislation down on paper in the manner that meets your ambitions. Um, and with the bills office and the the, the um, drafting, that's that's quite a protracted process. Once you get past that point, uh, I think the process becomes easier. There's a lot of toing and froing in the first process if you're relying on the the bills office and their drafters, and that's understandable. Uh, so getting past that point, once you're clear what you want to do in the bill and that you've got the right way of doing it within the the draft, then it's a matter of defending and explaining and promoting the cause uh, that you're seeking to defend. And I think that's where 
the real advantage of the sponsor being on the scrutinising committee comes in, because you know when someone reads a legislative proposal cold and it isn't their proposal, they might get in some sense the wrong end of the stick, and a committee could spend a bit of time, I think as I described it, you know going down rabbit holes about something. If the bill sponsor is there and says no, that's not what's intended, and lest anyone thinks that is what's intended, I will change that portion or I will bring in an amendment to deal with that. So you needn't waste your time on that. That's not what I'm trying to do. Uh, I think that's useful. Uh, and um, I think it just it kept the bill very much more on the rails, as it were, uh, uh, without, uh, without any diversions, and got you through the process a lot easier, and meant that when it came to consideration stage, you know, the tra it was pretty clear where the amendment discussion was going to be, uh, and you, ha you had a well-informed committee who um, were able to participate uh, very effectively in that process. So it, I think there are many advantages, but those are the couple that I would highlight. Thank you. Tom, is that your questions finished? Thank you, Tom. William, were you looking to ask Jim a question? Anyone else looking to come in? No. Um, Jim, thank you very much for your um, experience. Would you, I take it you'd be content enough if we had any additional queries, if we could follow it up in writing to yourself? Sure. No, no problem convenient. at all. Yeah, no problem. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye. Okay, so um, are there any, has anyone any comments after those two presentations from Kiva and Jim? Um, and we could, are we content to agree the next steps um, proposed in Nemer's paper? Agreed? Okay. So um, thank you for that. Agenda item five is the electronic voting and the briefing by Reyes. You may, you may recall that um, we, we're, we're going to receive a, a, a briefing on electronic voting and some of the statements made by the Speaker in correspondence in relation to proxy voting in particular, the Speaker believed that it's worth exploring whether electronic voting could bring further improvements and efficiencies to the Assembly. Um, we haven't um, finalised our position on a possible extension to permanent proxy voting arrangements, but we did note the Speaker's comments and agreed to receive this briefing. So at page 35 of our pack um, from Emer, at page 38 is a paper from Reyes, uh, and in addition, at page 14 of the table papers, um, just a note to correspondence from the Business Committee, requesting that our committee explore the, and I'll quote, explore the potential of progress in electronic voting further, in particular the feasibility of, pardon me, feasibility of do, doing so in the current climate. So um, we'll park that and we'll come back to it. So Ray McCaffrey is here to brief the committee. Ray, I'd like to welcome you get back to the committee again. Thank you, um, Chair. And if you just want to proceed with your briefing, thank you. Sure. Uh, thanks, Chair, and good afternoon, members. So the paper provides clarification uh, of what electronic voting is in parliamentary chambers, uh, its use in other legislatures, and whether there are any procedural considerations required to support its introduction. Uh, so we'll cover the key points of the paper uh, and then address any questions uh, members might have. And I suppose the first thing to say is that the paper addresses temporary measures included in other places to really allow for the effective continuation of parliamentary business uh, during the, the pandemic. Uh, so in normal circumstances, the paper probably would only have addressed the Scottish Parliament, Welsh Parliament and Doyle Aaron. Uh, but COVID uh, forced the, the House of Commons and the House of Lords uh, into experimenting with electronic and remote forms of voting. Uh, and I thought it was uh, important to address those measures. And really, in a sense, electronic voting in some ways is tied in with issues such as uh, remote voting and proxy voting. Um, so we'll examine the three legislatures that have had uh, electronic voting historically before COVID, uh, and then I'll turn to look at the House of Commons and House of Lords. 
So turning first to the Scottish Parliament, uh, electronic voting for members has been available since the new Scottish Parliament building was opened uh, in 2004. And the approach is as follows. Uh, so in the chamber, the providing officer asks MSPs a question. Uh, if they do not all agree with the question, they will vote. Uh, this question then appears on screens on the MSP's desks. They can answer yes, no, or abstain. Uh, they normally have 30 seconds to touch the screen to answer. Uh, then the presiding officer reads out uh, the results in the vote. Decision time in the Scottish Parliament uh, is the period which normally begins at 5 p.m., uh, where a meeting of the Parliament is held on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday. Uh, and at 12 uh, noon, where a meeting of the Parliament is held on Friday. Uh, so rather than take votes after each item of business, it's, they're held over until those decision times. Um, electronic voting, well, it's largely worked without controversy. Um, although in 2016, a missing vote from a Labour member allowed the government to narrowly uh, avoid a defeat on a council tax debate. Uh, the Labour member in question was insistent that she had pressed the button to cast her vote, uh, but the parliamentary authorities were clear uh, that there had been nothing defective with the voting system. Um, in June 2016, the system um, actually failed uh, and the vote on education had to be postponed until the following day. Um, and according to the BBC, the system as a whole actually had to be replaced before this back in 2011 at a cost of uh, £270,000. Although this was because the original supplier was no longer uh, able to provide spare parts. So in terms of the impact of COVID um, in the Scottish Parliament, a digital voting system had been developed uh, by June 2020 and was available to members returning after the summer recess. Uh, so this allowed members to vote on chamber business if they were participating even via video conference. Um, again, it appeared to work well. Uh, some members did express concern at the system when having to vote on uh, large numbers of amendments, um, but again, generally it, it bettered in quite well and most of the issues were due to um, human error and connectivity, connectivity issues. Um, so following consultation with members, uh, the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee recommended a change to standing orders be made permanent uh, so that the rule no longer only refers to the use of the single voting system that is used to run votes when all members are in the chamber. Uh, this had followed a recommendation from the parliamentary corporate body that the rule change be made permanent uh, to support the resilience of the parliament. Uh, that was part of an inquiry looking at the resilience of the Scottish Parliament's procedures, which was really um, brought about by, by COVID. Um, of course, if at any stage the electronic voting system fails, there is provision for an alternative method of voting by show of hands or road call. Uh, turning to the Welsh Parliament, um, again, the Welsh Parliament Chamber uh, is an electronic debating chamber. Uh, a dedicated computer system operates in the chamber uh, and all information relevant to plenary proceedings is accessible via each member's individual computer. Uh, members also have full access to the rest of their ICT system in the chamber. Uh, so basically at the base of the computer, there is a slot for a card which identifies each member. There are also three buttons. So it's green to vote in favour, white to abstain and red to vote against. Uh, during the COVID uh, pandemic, uh, the Welsh Parliament developed a secure app to allow members to continue to vote electronically while not in the chamber. Uh, this was first used in July 2020. Uh, and subsequently standing orders were changed to allow for members to vote uh, from any location by electronic means. Um, now, there, there was some sort of significant controversy around the remote voting system in October 2021. Uh, a Conservative member of the Parliament missed a narrow vote on compulsory COVID passports for nightclubs. Uh, the BBC report that carried that story, it set out in, in the research paper, and there was some back and forth between the member and officials in the Parliament over where the blame lay on that occasion. Uh, so it does highlight uh, potential issues, uh, sort of when you go beyond the standard electronic voting within a chamber and roll it out for members who aren't physically present on the, on the parliamentary estate. Uh, next, turning to, to Doyle Aaron, um, electronic voting was introduced in the Chamber of the Doyle in uh, 2002 after consideration by the Subcommittee on Doyle Reform at that stage. Uh, the Subcommittee recommended a system whereby members uh, would have to vote at designated seats 
uh, rather than, for example, using a card system. And the reason given at the time was that the main security uh, attaching to the designated seating method of voting is that it is visibly obvious whether or not a particular seat is occupied if the corresponding light on the display board is illuminated while all members are present in the chamber and voting at the same time. Uh, nonetheless, there was a recognition that deliberate or accidental misuse of the system could not be ruled out. Um, and again, just divisions are taken electronically, and except in the case of uh, election of the Cancolia, uh, nomination of the Taoiseach and members of the government, and motions of confidence in the government. The system is tested on each sitting day to ensure all aspects are working. And again, uh, as with other legislatures, there are provisions in place to amend the result if a member inadvertently presses the wrong button. Uh, so basically, after the, the bells have been rung and the doors locked, uh, the Cancolia announces the item of business, the question to be decided, and the names of the tellers for each side. Uh, the Cancolia advises members of the requirement to take their designated seat for the purposes of electronic voting. Uh, the clerk starts the vote, the voting system goes live, and the deputies have one minute to vote. Uh, each deputy has to vote, uh, of course, from their assigned seat. They will previously have been informed of their seat number. Uh, a deputy's assigned seat is only changed on instruction by the relevant whip. Uh, and there, again, there are provisions in place for votes to be taken by means other than electronic, for example, where the system is deemed unreliable. Uh, standing orders also allow for a division to be run again, where the difference between the total of yes and no votes is 10 or less. Uh, now, as members may be aware, the Doyle was embroiled in some controversy uh, back in October 2019 when it emerged that members had been voting on behalf of colleagues using their electronic voting system located at each seat in the chamber. Uh, so in response to this controversy, um, Professor David Farrell of the University College Dublin was commissioned to review the voting system in the Doyle. Uh, his subsequent report recommended that the, the installation of additional cameras to record the act of voting uh, would seem to be the best on the grounds of effectiveness and cost. Uh, so installing additional cameras would enable the recording of all deputies and their seats as they vote. And then this data could then be stored for a period of time to allow Doyle authorities to carry out an audit of the vote if needed. Uh, this option was agreed to by the Committee uh, on Procedure in May uh, 2020. Uh, I think some of the cost was going to be in and around, um, well, there were various estimates given, um, but it seemed to be sort of anywhere between 50 and 100,000 euro. Um, in terms of remote electronic voting during COVID, well, this was not available to members uh, because the Irish constitution uh, prohibits it. Uh, members must be present to cast their votes. Um, so this, this prohibits proxy voting. Um, and when the Doyle moved uh, some of its business to the Dublin Convention Centre during uh, the COVID pandemic, electronic voting facilities were available. Um, currently, there is a private member's bill, um, which I believe is at second stage. This would amend the constitution to uh, allow for uh, remote voting. Um, so it will be interesting to see how, how that bill fares. Um, just... Briefly on the House of Commons and the House of Lords, there was no provision for electronic voting in the House of Commons chamber uh, until the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, 29th of April 2020, the leader of the House, uh, Jacob Rees-Moggs, announced plans to experiment with the electronic voting. Uh, he did emphasise that it would be a temporary measure. Uh, subsequently, the first remote voting division was held in May 2020. Uh, so the voting system used the existing member hub, which MPs use for tabling parliamentary questions or early day motions, and it can be accessed by MPs on any device and uses single sign-on and multi-factor authentication to ensure it's secure. Um, so the process uh, operated as follows. The member in charge of an item of business uh, may designate it for remote division, and this designation is listed on the order paper. Uh, the Speaker's provision of determination on whether a remote division is required will be announced at the start of business for the day, and a final decision will be made when the end of that particular item of business is reached. When a division is called, MPs received a notification by text and email. The division bells were sounded on the parliamentary estate as usual, and MPs had 15 minutes to cast their votes. The Speaker could declare the results null and void and order a rerun if technical issues interfered with the vote. And it was quite short-lived anyway. On the 20th of May 2020, the order on remote voting lapsed and was not renewed. Uh, 
Very briefly on the House of Lords, remote voting was introduced on the 15th of June 2020, allowing members to vote on a laptop, smartphone or other device. A new online hub, Peer Hub, was established to allow the operation of remote voting. Uh, members were only eligible to participate in the vote if they were doing so from a place of work on the parliamentary estate, unless the member was exempted from doing so through uh, eligibility for ongoing virtual participation. Members were asked to confirm when voting via Peer Hub that they, are in, that they were on a place uh, of work on the parliamentary estate. Um, and it, it largely worked uh, similar to, to the way we've seen in other legislatures. Um, if a decision is not reached by collecting voices, the chair instructs the clerk to start an electronic division. Uh, members have 10 minutes to record their votes electronically using the Peer Hub system. Um, division bells will be sounded on the estate and on the electronic voting site. Um, members who have accessibility needs, uh, which means they can't use the electronic voting system, must have confirmed arrangements in advance and at least 24 four hours in advance of when they are seeking to use it for the first time with the clerk of the table office for their vote to be recorded. Uh, or they could actually just cast their votes with the clerk at the table. And again, the chair may extend, interrupt or suspend an electronic division if notified of a technical problem. And finally, just uh, some issues for consideration, members, and really just drawing on the experience and practice in other legislatures. Um, I just wanted to highlight a, a few key areas for further consideration. So, I mean, first and foremost, the potential cost of installing and maintaining an electronic voting system uh, alongside feasibility of structural or technical changes to the assembly chamber. Uh, procedural safeguards if and when electronic voting should fail, whether any items should be excluded from electronic voting, uh, security measures to prevent corruption and or abuse of the system. Um, would it encompass remote voting or would it only be available at, at uh, members' desks? Um, would the current interim system in the House of Lords be an option whereby members can vote electronically and remotely as long as they are on the parliamentary estate? Uh, would separate infrastructure be required in the assembly chamber or could this be minimized by allowing members to use devices such as laptops and smartphones rather than build it into uh, the desks and the members currently use and finally could an electronic system be incorporated into the one drive system uh sure that's that's a, a run through of the paper i'm happy to try to address any questions that members might have Thank you, Ray. I mean, that was there's a lot going on there. Um, so, so thank you. And we did receive a very good briefing paper from yourself on this. So I'm going to throw it open to members if you have any questions. Emer, can you see anyone who's asked, asking questions? No hands raised, Chair. Okay, so I mean, basically, the briefing paper is, as I said, it is fairly substantial. Um, I just want to thank Ray again for that. Um, so, Ray, not, because we don't have any questions, we're just going to let you go, if, if that's okay. Um, yeah, that's okay. right. Man. And just to, again, put, um, on behalf of the committee, put our thanks for the preparation of the paper and your attendance at the committee today. So thank you. Thanks, Chair. Bye now. Thank you. Bye. Um, so, members... The memo, the memo does describe the introduction, indeed the briefing paper goes into a lot of detail of any electronic, electronic voting at the Assembly of whatever type would need to involve steps including a requirement to get political agreement within this as this committee as well as the Assembly to develop new standing orders. And in addition to any introduction of an electronic voting system would also then involve procurement, installation and integration of equipment and software, um, which is done by the Assembly Commission. Um, the paper, which has been provided to us last week um, to consider agreeing that in our legacy report, um, where we recommend that the committee on procedures in the next mandate should carry out an inquiry into whether electronic voting should be introduced at the Assembly. So also, um, the committee may want to consider it prudent to write at this point to the Assembly Commission, inviting it to consider undertaking scoping work in relation to the capital and infrastructural works that a future electronic voting system may require. 
And as we noted earlier, um, we've just yesterday received correspondence from the business committee informing us of its support um, for the use of us, for us exploring the potential of progressing electronic voting further, in particular, the feasibility of doing so in the current mandate. So basically what I'm asking is if we could, if we are agreed, could we write to the Assembly Commission asking them to scope out the costs? Basically, that's it. So how do members feel about that? Okay. Um, and, and if we are agreed to proceed in this, um, and I've seen or heard no dissent, um, we should explore the potential of progressing electronic voting further with the view to establishing the feasibility of doing so um, during this mandate and to seek the agreement that the committee should write to the Commission to clarify how quickly their procurement, installation and in integration of equipment um, would cost. And so we're happy to do that. Chair, or sorry, Tom. Yeah, Chair, I have no difficulty with writing uh, to the uh, committee or to the Commission. No, no problem at all on that issue. I do have some concerns, though, about seeking to try to progress this within this mandate. We're a very short space of time left within this mandate, and on the report that we got there, and we're very good research papers, as you, as you have indicated, but on the report there is there was a number of areas that uh, was pointed out to us that, uh, as a committee, we would need to be given consideration to. And obviously, they were run through so quick that I only managed to get some of them down, and it would be beneficial to get a, a list of all of those again. Uh, and based on that, I, I don't think that we would... I don't think for one week at a time, first of all, to, to go through all of this and scrutinise all of this, to seek to bring it in in this particular mandate. There's too many issues at stake, in my opinion, uh, but I've no difficulty in writing uh, and asking about costs and all of that type of thing. But I do have a difficulty with the other. Okay, um, Tom, I'm taking on board what you said. Um, but just to remind everybody, it was a business committee who wrote to us, asking us to write to the commission, because if we need to get a change in standing orders for this to happen, it needs to be done by this committee, then agreed by the assembly and just to remind you that on page 54 and 55 of the pack that Emer gave to us is a list of all the issues. So we're content to write to the commission to try and scope out the financial costs and we'll do that and then we'll come back to this. Kira, I believe you're um, yeah. question. Yeah. Um, Kira, sorry. sorry. Yeah. Kira and no, Annette will bring, bring you in next. Uh, very much content, obviously, to proceed. Um, just the one with regards to the scope and the cost, obviously, um, Ray brought in a, a lot of different options regarding, you know, the use of phones, the OneDrive system and stuff. So it's very much obviously scoping out the cost analysis of each of them options. Yeah. Uh, but I think it's obviously, it's like, why is this moving me the times? And I'm just conscious of Rosemary wants in, but from Rosemary, Rosemary's previous conversation as well, um, I very much pay heed for the garden work like balance and how we manage and improve um, the operations of the assembly and how we operate so you know um, we need to move with the times as well regarding electronics yeah <laughs> so happy to proceed with that but conscious of when scoping ensure the the other finance all the options um, are scoped out from a financial perspective particularly the likes of the, using the OneDrive system and phones Thank you. Kara Rosemary Jewett, would you like to come in? Yeah, thank you. Um, just in relation to electronic voting, I, th I think that we've got to got to decide where this... One, one thing we haven't spoken about, do we use the electronic voting just within the Stormont buildings or do we are we looking at using it from home? You know, what is our place of work? Is our place of work our Stormont building or is it our offices? Or is it our homes? And I think there's a lot of decisions there to be made. And Rosemary, you're right. So I think, so for example, you know, we were allowed to, we are still allowed to use the hybrid system in terms of the assembly attendance at uh, the um, 
sitting days and indeed attendance at committees. So, I mean, it's a valid, valid question. We just need to get the cost for all that. William, would you like to come in? Yeah, thanks. Uh, whenever, whenever Ray was talking, he, he used the term a number of times to allow. And I think one of the things we need to look at is um, obviously there are people that from time to time who uh, are ill. And I remember years ago seeing scenes in the House of Commons where members who were gravely ill brought in on in, in stretchers or um, wheelchairs and so on who, who really shouldn't have been anywhere near the House of Commons. They were so ill and were, were brought in from hospital. So I think when you take in illness, disablement and emergency situations that people have in family, cares and so on, that all needs to be taken into account. And then the, the recent example there in Wales of the guy, the Tory boy who was over in the party conference and his vote wasn't registered whenever um, uh, they were voting on the um, COVID passport, I think it was. Yeah. yeah. And the Welsh government won the vote by one vote. Um, I think I think I think Rosemary's point is is I would just be concerned about about this that that um, this leads to members taking a decision to sell them be it Stormont and you know and working from home and whatever uh, they you know they have a duty and responsibility to be uh, there when they can be and I I'm not as Ray said if people have circumstances at home that prevent them from doing so that absolutely should be taken into consideration. Um, so I think there is a balance to be had around that, and I, and I do think Tom's point is right as well, in terms of the t the, the, the time scale, because at the end of this month we're we're four months away from um, the the assembly being closed down for uh, part in the election. So I need to, all those things to be taken into the consideration in the round. Thanks. And William, I think you've hit the right note. It's a balance to be struck in all this. But basically, we're asking the Commission to try and scope this out. If we could do that in this mandate, and then it'll be part of our legacy report for the next incoming um, procedures committee. I think that's what I'm hearing from people. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that's why we've all got whips. Whips make sure that we're here. And if we can't be here for whatever reason, then it's between the individual and their whip and their party. Um, I mean, and no one most of the whips, I don't think they'll let us sit in the house, but sure, we'll say nothing. <laughs> anyway, um, so, Emer, are you clear about what we've agreed? Um, if you don't mind, I'll, re I'll recap. So, the yeah. committee is content to write to the Commission in terms of scoping the costs, and that is the cost of each of the different options which the paper outlines, and also the committee is content to scope what is possible in this mandate? Yes, that's correct. That's correct. And also what, what isn't is put in our legacy report for the, the next incoming procedures committee. Right. Thank you. Because we all need to stand over that as well. Is that far enough? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Emer. Um, so, statement of entitlements for an official opposition committee actions following the Assembly approval of the ARC report. So, you'll be aware that on last Tuesday, the 9th of November, the ARC report on the statement of entitlements for an official opposition was debated and agreed unanimously by the, by the Assembly. And our committee previously acknowledged that this work would need to be addressed as a priority. So once the Assembly had approved the ARC report, um, that we're coming back to this and we expected that. So at page 58 of our pack, Emer has provided us up with a paper which sets out the detail of the procedural changes to standing orders stemming from the report's recommendations. Now, there's a lot to go through here. Um, Emer, if you don't mind, just to go through each of them individually. Um, so. And then what we can do is just go through each recommendation, agree or not agree, and then take it forward. I think that's the most straightforward way of doing this. Mm -hmm. Are members content to do that? Yep. Agreed. Okay, Amor, do you mind doing that? Yep, no, I'm happy to do that. Thank you. Okay, so there's there were six specific recommendations which Mr. Trevor Rainey had highlighted would require procedural amendments. And these recommendations were in or recommendations four, six, seven, eight, ten, and eleven. Yeah. So, Emer, do you want to just go through them? 
Yep, so hopefully members will recall that committee agreed that some of these recommendations did not actually require changes to standing orders and the cover memo uh, draws these out and really focuses down on the changes that would be required in relation to recommendations 7, 8 and 10. So um, members, recommendations 7 and 10 are a bit more straightforward than uh, all, of the recommend all of the items related to recommendation 8. So I'm proposing to deal with recommendations 7 and 10 first. The questions which require committee decisions are boxed off and shaded throughout that opposition memo. Mm -hmm. Where there is a change specific to an existing standing order, and the Assembly has already agreed a position there, I'm seeking committee agreement for that standing order to be referred to legal services for the purposes of redrafting and for any associated legal advice. And then I'll draw the attention of members to the specific aspects which require further discussion or agreement and are not yet ready to be referred to legal services, if that's okay. No, that's grand, Amber. That's, that's clear. Okay, so... Are members agreed? Yeah, okay. Okay, thank you. So, proposing to take recommendations 7 and 10 together because these recommendations refer to the specific standing order that um, it has been agreed for change. Are members content to agree that recommendations 7 and 10 of the ARC report for changes to standing orders 20 and standing order 49 are referred to legal services for the purposes of drafting and associated legal advice? Recommendation 7 is um, with regard to the facility to strengthen the questioning of the executive that would be provided to the official opposition and that's by amending standing order 20 subsection 7 to provide the first oral question to ministers would come from the official opposition and recommendation 10 is the committee content that an amendment be made to Standing Order 49, subsection 2, to provide procedural certainty that when an official opposition is operational, it should have the opportunity to be represented on all statutory committees and that both of these be referred to legal services for the pur purposes of redrafting and for any associated legal advice? Yeah, everybody content? Okay, Emer, that's that's straightforward. Do you want to go to recommendation eight, yes. which is a bit more tricky? Yeah. So again, um, I've tried to draw out the ones where there's options, and then bunch the ones together that are a bit more straightforward. Okay. Yeah. The recommendation you'll eight you'll recall was that all the standing orders required under the Assembly and Executive Reform Act 2016 be developed and implemented, and listed under that were a range of different areas. Taking each aspect of this in turn then, the first one was the formation of the opposition, including qualification. These are summarised um, on page 61 of your pack. So first of all, is, is the committee content at this stage that amendment be made to standing orders to provide that a qualifying party is any party whose members comprise 8% or more of the total number of members of the Assembly and which does not contain a member who is a minister and that this matter be referred to legal services for the purposes of redrafting and amending standing orders. So are, are people happy again to refer recommendation 8 um, for a legal opinion and to, for that draft to come back for further discussion like 7 and 10? Are we agreed? Okay, Emer, is that, is that okay? Yeah, that was aspect one. So that's the formation of the opposition, including qualification. Okay. The second as, uh, and third are about the timing of the formation of the opposition. In terms of the timing of the formation, so the bottom of page 63 of your pack, is the committee content to seek legal advice as to whether the current iteration of standing order 45A is sufficient to comply with the requirements of Section 3 of the 2016 Act. 
Yeah, I, I think we all we need to get legal advice in all these matters, Emer, just to make sure that they are. It may turn out that we the current um, standing order forty eight or forty five eight is sufficient, but we'll just get legal advice and make sure. So are members content with that as well. Sorry. Okay, Emer, do you want Sorry, do you want to proceed? Yeah, no, it's just been brought to my attention. Sorry that we've lost quorum. In terms of taking the decision, and um, so well, we need to park it because these decisions require quorum. So, is it William Humphreys that's that's left? Yeah, it is William. Thomas, could you see if you could catch William? Perhaps if we just pause for a couple of minutes to see if we can get through these decisions, please. Just take a wee minute, everybody, and if we can't, we're going to have to suspend. Do you want me to suspend the meeting and try and make contact with William? If you don't mind, Deemer, please. If we come back at... J say, Chair, Chair yeah? sorry, just got a thing through from William to say that he was struggling. At that end, they had lost sound and the loss of connection and he would try and get back as soon as possible. Great. Well, listen, we'll just pause it for a minute while we're waiting on William reconnect. Hopefully you will. My, um, I'm taking these North Belfast. My internet keeps saying it's unstable. Um, so we're literally just around the corner from each other. So there's a lot of road works going on. It could be something to do with that. But anyway, we'll, we'll just pause it until 1540 and we'll just wait and see what happens. You content that I turn off the live at the minute? This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room. Didn't know. Okay, so listen, what I was going to suggest was if we could go through the rest of today's business, and why we can't agree because we haven't got a quorum, what we do is that we come back by email no later than tomorrow, if it's possible, because it will it will involve the seeking of legal advice, and it's best to be honest with you if um we could do that. I mean, it, if there's any objections to this, and because William isn't here, um Tom's here. So Tom, what I'm asking you to do is, if there are any objections to anything that's raised after Emer goes through it all, that they are put in writing to Emer by close of play of business tomorrow. Is that far enough? Yeah. Is that okay? Good stuff. Um, so, um, Emer, we left off, you were going into the second part. Yep. I think. Yep. The second part of recommendation eight. That's correct, yes. Okay, could you proceed then, Emer? Thank you. Yep, so in terms of the timing of the formation of the opposition, um, I had asked if committees can tend to seek legal advice as to whether or not Standing Order 45A is sufficient to comply with Section 3 of the 2016 Act. Um, no members had raised an objection to that. Um, in terms of the next subsection of Recommendation 8, it relates to the dissolution of the opposition and both the timing of the formation and the dissolution of the opposition, both of these um, will require new standing orders. So the first question to members is, are you content to bring forward the standing orders that would give effect to this? And the second yeah. is to draw attention to members, draw to members' attention that um, it may be necessary to seek legal advice to um, check out the effect, if any, of the relevant provisions of the Northern Ireland Brackets Ministers' Elections and Petition of Concern Bill. So that bill we've been talking about for a number of meetings. Any effect yeah. that it may have on the issue of standing orders necessary to give effect to those sections three and four, which are the timing of the formation of the opposition and the dissolution of the opposition. Yeah, and they were all done arising from the 2016 Act, which has already been agreed. So we're still asking for a legal opinion on both aspects of Recommendation 8. Is that right, Emer? Um, first of all, I'm asking our members content to bring forward changes to Stanton Orders to give effect to this, yes. those two. So, secondly... So, OK, so let's go through the first part. Are people agreed on the first part? Yeah. Okay, Good. and then sorry, Emer. The second part. The second part is legal advice to set out okay. if there's any effect of the NI Meepock bill. Okay. 
Okay. She's currently so going through. So again, we're going to ask for legal advice mm -hmm. on that aspect as well. Hi, William. William, is it the works? The um, they're 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 upgrading works on. I think it's Woodfield, Crumlin, and along the Cliftonville. It's uh, something to do with Wi-Fi connection. Is that what it is? Because my connection's unstable as well. Can you hear William? Just just now, I can yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So William, what we've agreed to do in relation to recommendation eight, there are two parts. We need to change the stand in order to give effect. Um, and to, we need to draft a new stand in order that would, would give effect to the provision um, that's laid out in recommendation eight along the need to have a stand in order for a dissolution of opposition, okay, which is section four of the 2016 Act, right? So that's the first part. And the second part is that that was, a, so that's agreed. But it's a great, we also need to get legal advice on the effect of any about the relevant provisions of the Northern Ireland Minister's Elections and Petitions of Concern Bill, which may have on the issue on any standing orders necessary to give effect to sections three and four of the 2016 Act. So, Emma, are you clear? Yeah, our members content to then refer that to legal services, yep. yep. Agreed. Yes. Okay. Yep. So in relation to um, topical questions from leadership of the opposition, section six and 15 brackets one and 15 brackets two, paragraph 29 and par sorry, paragraph 29 of page 65, the standing order 20A bracket 6 currently states that where there is an official opposition and at least one member of the official opposition has submitted his or her name to the speaker to indicate they wish to, to ask a topical question, then the first topical question must be asked by a member of the official opposition. So in practice, this will mean that the first question to all ministers during topical questions will come from the official opposition. It does not provide, as envisaged by section 6 of the 2016 Act, that in the case of the first and deputy first minister, both the first and second questions put to the first and deputy first minister during topical questions should come from the leadership of the opposition. So what I want to get your agreement on, if it's content that stamp and order should be amended to provide for this. Is that okay? Emer, that's that's clear really there, isn't it? Um, the, there's a subsection just prior to that that did require some discussion by the committee. Carol, sorry. Okay, so if you want to, okay, so... Page... Go through that, go through that, Emer. Page 64 and 65 of the pack. Um, okay, I've got, I've got those up, yeah. Okay, so this subsection uh, deals with the leadership of the opposition, and there's there's two yeah. issues here. So is the committee content that standing orders should make provision for the offices in the leadership of the opposition by conferring titles? If so, what should those titles be? Or does the committee want further time to consider the issue of specific titles? Uh, sure, can I just interject there? Um, yeah. Is, is this not all relevant to the legal advice we're seeking? Well, it could be, William, that's the question that we're being asked. Well, I don't think we should make any, any decisions until we get the legal advice. But the legal advice is on the changing of standing orders and what they may look like. This is all in keeping with the 2016 Act. So, Emer, if that's possible, could we get some suggestions on what those titles may be? And then we'll consider it at a later stage. Yeah, I can take that, can take that one away. Okay. And so, that. sorry for jumping ahead. I'll go back to topical questions from the leadership of the opposition, which has yet to be named. So, what I was asking was that topical questions, first topical question would go to a member of the official opposition. Um, and in practice, that would mean that the first question to all ministers during topical questions 
will come from the official opposition. However, it does not provide, as envisaged by Section 6 of the 2016 Act, that in the case of the First and Deputy First Minister, both the first and second questions put to the First and Deputy First Minister during topical questions should come from the leadership of the opposition. So we also need to get an agreement if we are content that Stanton orders should, provided, should be amended to provide for this as well. And do we need to get legal advice on that too? Chair, the question, you the no? question is... Did you say no, Emer? Yeah, no, the question for the committee is whether or not committee is content that standing orders should be amended to make provisions. So it's already in the 2016 yeah, agreement? it's already agreed yeah. mm. the Assembly. Yeah, it's so already there. That isn't, is not. Just for clarification, yeah. that is not one of the elements that we would be seeking legal advice on. Yeah, okay. So how do members feel about this? Okay, so I'm not hearing any dissent. Well, I, 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 I part, I've already said, Chair, I, I, think, I think all of it should be predicated on legal advice. And that's, that's my opinion. Yeah, but if the legal advice comes back and says the same what Amherst just repeated. So do you want to put this off until the next meeting? To try and get some counsel from your party? No, no, it's not. No, we, we've asked for legal advice. It's not. It's not. I'm not looking counsel from my party. If we've asked for legal advice, I think we should wait for that legal advice. And if that is going to happen very quickly, then that allows us to make informed decisions. Uh, I'm just concerned that if, if the legal advice uh, isn't sought first, that those 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 decisions may have knock-on effects and other things we're agreeing without the legal advice there to back it up. Okay, so fair enough, William. I hear what you're saying. So, Emer, even though it's your opinion, we don't need legal, legal advice. Even if the legal advice come back comes back and says that, could we seek that as well, please? So the question, um, just can I clarify with the committee what the question I'm asking for legal's opinion on is in relation to the topical questions from the leadership of the op opposition. There is already stand provision in Standing Order 20A, subsection 6. Mm -hmm. So there is already provision in Standing Orders. It does not, however, as envisaged by the 2016 Act, um, align directly with it. And in the case of the First and Deputy First Minister, both the first and second questions during topical questions would come from the leadership of the opposition. That is the change that the 2016 Act would require to be made to the existing standing order. So this isn't a new standing order, it would be a change in the current arrangements. Yeah, so we're just getting a legal advice on that, Emer. Right. Just on a change to the existing standing order, 20 brackets A. Right. Okay. Yeah. So I also want to advise the committee that sections 15.1 and 15.2 state that Stanton Orders must make provision that the first question put to your minister during topical questions comes from the chairperson of the committee established to advise and assist the minister in the formulation of policy with respect to matters within the minister's responsibility. The purpose of topical questions is to provide an additional opportunity for members to hold ministers and their departments to account. While a question from the chairperson might be an informed question based on work that the committee is currently looking at, the chairperson of a statutory committee acts on behalf of the whole committee and not a member of the party that is either in the executive or opposition. So therefore, a standing order as envisaged by section 15.1 and 15.2 are agreed. This will, mean, this will mean removing the existing provision for the opposition to ask the first question to other ministers. So that's a bit convoluted, Emer, to be honest. And the other aspect of it is chair, chairpersons need to have the flexibility to separate themselves from their chair and ask a question as a spokesperson if both are the same. So can we get some advice on that?
Yeah. I can ask okay. your advice on that. The question for the committee with regard to the second aspect of questions, topical questions, was whether standing orders should make provision that the first topical question to a minister comes from the chair of the statutory committee, with the exception of the first and second question to the first minister and deputy first minister, or whether the existing arrangements for the first topical question to come from the opposition should remain. That, there's a decision for the committee here. So, um, should I it think... be as it is now, or should it change? Well, since we've asked for legal advice on the previous item, um, we'll wait until that comes back and we'll park this one and come back to it, Emer. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yes. Because it goes leads right into the next, um, the next issue, which has already been raised, um, and that's about asking the first and second question to the first and deputy first minister topical question. So anyway, um, speaking rights in the assembly, paragraph thirty three, um, pages sixty six to sixty seven. So if we're content to seek legal advice on whether existing provisions in Stanton Order 17 brackets 4 and brackets 5 are sufficient for the purpose, purposes of giving effect to section 7 of the 1916 19, Act or does the committee wish to consider alternative arrangements for speaking rights? The committee could return to this latter point after receiving legal advice, which I think we should do, Emer, if members are agreed. So we'll get the legal advice on the first bit and consider this next bit when we get that. Okay. okay. Emer, is that clear? Yep, noted, no problem. Um, the, the last three proposed changes are, are more straightforward. So the enhanced speaking rights for the opposition. Yep. So paragraph 37 and pages 67 to 68, that, that it's asking us if we're content that Stanton Order should now make provision for enhanced speaking rights for the opposition as set out in the ARC report and agreed by the Assembly and that this should include a minimum of 10 days per year set aside for opposition businesses. business. So are we agreed? Okay. Um, the opposition right to chair the Public Accounts Committee, which is set out in paragraphs 41 and pages 69 of our PACs, and it's to seek if we can agree that an amendment be made to Stanton Orders to provide for the rights of the opposition to nominate the chair and deputy chair were appropriate of the Public Accounts Committee and that this, this is to be referred to legal services for the purposes of drafting and associated legal advice. Can we get an agreement on that as well? Can I ask, can I ask Chair, um, what does it mean, Deputy Chair, where appropriate? What does that mean? So, so it's just, well, I mean, I think Chair, it's the way to hold faults at times. Hmm. So that's I mean, my understanding of it. Amir or Paul, do you want to come in? Uh, happy to, Chair. Uh, this depends on the number of parties that make up an opposition. So if there's only one party in the opposition, that party would be entitled to chair Public Accounts Committee. If there were two parties in the opposition, then the largest party would be entitled to chair the Public Accounts Committee, and the second largest party in the opposition would be entitled to deputy chair. So that's why it says they're deputy chair yeah. if appropriate, because we don't know whether or not yeah. there would be more than one party yeah. in the opposition. I have to say, as chair and chairman of the current Public Accounts Committee, I do have to say um, that, I, that I think this is an overreach. I think the, the, the um, Public Accounts Committee has operated and, and done a job of work, regardless of who the minister is, regardless of which department it is, that has been absolutely fair uh, and equitable across the departments. And I think, I think that that has been one of the success stories, in my opinion, of the evolution at Stormont, that those, that those committees through the chairs, uh, the vice chairs and the membership have operated without fear or favour to the minister, whether it's the minister in that party or not. 
Uh, and, and, and I think the history of the Public Accounts Committee absolutely reflects that, so I'm not comfortable with that, but others may be. Yeah, but again, this was agreed in the 26th agreement, so that's that's why it's been brought up here. Um, so, so when you're saying you're not comfortable, you're voting against it, William? I mean, um, what, we're being asked, what we're being asked to do is to refer this to legal services for the purposes of drafting an associated legal advice. Mm -hmm. Well, so, we don't legal. We don't the legal advice coming back, okay. but I'm not. But I'm not. But I'm not comfortable with it because I, I do think, regardless who's been chairman, and they're you know I've only been chairman a year and a half or but regardless who's been chairman, I think they've operated, and the committee has operated, um, uh, absolutely impartially. Okay. Okay, so members, I'm going to go to the membership of the Business Committee for the opposition, which is set out in paragraphs 43, page 69 to 70. And I want to find out if we're content to agree that an amendment be made to Stanton Orders to provide for membership of the opposition on the Business Committee and that this too be referred to legal services for the purposes of drafting and associated legal advice. So it's the same as the previous one. We'll get the draft on and get the legal advice and come back to it. Is that agreed? Okay, and finally, section 15, paragraphs three of the 2016 Act provides that staff and orders must make provision for an annual debate on the executive's legislative timetable. The issue of the executive's legislative timetable and annual debate in relation to it will need to be considered in the context of managing legislative pressures generally. And the committee will also consider these issues as part of its inquiry on private members' bills. So are we content to agree that such a standard order should be agreed, but the detail of how this might work should be considered within the context of the ongoing PMB inquiry? Are we agreed? Okay, thank you. So agenda item seven, NI Minister's Elections and Petitions of Concerns Bill update. Members, you will recall at our last meeting on the 3rd of November, the committee agreed for the draft issues paper to be circulated to members for the purposes of discussion within party groups. The committee further agreed that having discussed within party groups, members would discuss views, feedback, comments, and raise any emerging queries at the next meeting. At page 72 is a paper from Emer with annexes at pages 76 and 83. And at the last meeting, it was agreed that the issues paper would be circulated by email for discussion of party groups. I don't know if all members have had the opportunity to, to have those discussions. I'm just seeking views on this. No, you haven't had it. Um, Amir, it would, it would appear that the, the the parties here haven't had an opportunity to discuss this, and um, we're also missing the SDLP and people for profit. I think is the SDLP yes, she needs on this. Yeah. So, um, can can we and appreciate Paul your attendance here because you were here to not only support Amir but also support the committee. The, any queries? I think we need to come back to this, um, given that we have all the parties here. Is that is that fair enough? Okay. Uh, absolutely, Chair. We're we're at your discretion here. Yeah, it's Paul. We, we we've only got three parties here, and there there are others missing, and this is quite substantial pace. I mean, members did undertake to go and consult with their parties, and bring it back to the next meeting. I'm assuming that no one sent in their submissions by email in absence of not being here? No, no, nothing received in this item. No, they haven't. Okay, well then we're going to return to this at the at the, the next um, meeting. So can I ask, um, could even members in between that and Emir, if you could write out to all the people who aren't here, just write it to all members again if they could agree even their party responses to be issued um, as soon as possible, but certainly before the next meeting, which is when Wednesday the 24th of November. 
No, the next scheduled meeting is the 1st of December. 1st of okay. So, Emer, could we have the party responses by Wednesday, the 24th of November, if you could put that in correspondence, please? Certainly. Okay, thank you. So, item uh, 8 of the agenda is Stanton Orders Temporary Provisions and a review of those provisions. And you will be aware of the temporary provisions within Stanton Orders, which were introduced to allow the Assembly and Committee proceedings to continue during the COVID-19 pandemic. So, given the continuing pandemic, the Committee has on three occasions agreed to extend the temporary provisions before they ceased to have, an, have effect. All three committee motions were subsequently agreed by the Assembly. So the current provision is, with the temporary provisions, is that they will cease to have effect at the end of the mandate. And we're asking, and the committee did state to the Assembly, that it will continue to keep these provisions under review. So given the time left in this mandate and how busy it's likely to be when scheduling an Assembly of business, that we'll need to consider its options if it wishes to bring a motion to the House before the end of the mandate. So at page 98 of our PACS, Emer has provided us with a paper which gives some background to the temporary provisions and options the committee may wish to consider. But just by way of overview, the options are to do nothing uh, and let the provision cease to have effect after the end of the mandate. Option two, agree to extend all or some of the temporary provisions for a date in the new mandate. And three, consider whether all or some of the temporary provisions should be reviewed and considered for retention and standing orders on a permanent basis. Option four is agree to write to the CLG and the Business Committee to seek their views on options with a view to bring in responses back for discussion early January. The only issue I have is really the Business Committee rather than the CLG. The Business Committee is a formal committee, CLG is an informal liaison group, so that's my own view. But um, so, members, how do you feel? So, should we, should, should we go for option four now and come back to it? Right into the business committee seeking their views. Is that far enough? Because all the parties sure. are represented there. Chair, can I can I, can I just support what you've just said? I mean, I I do think uh, uh, Echo was a former chair of the, the CLG. Um, that it is an informal um, group, and therefore it is a case that we we need to operate. Um, through the the business committee, in my view, and I would I would yeah. I think a letter to the business committee would be appropriate. Yeah. Yeah. No. Thank you for that, William. So, Emer, could we just write to the business committee at this stage, seek their views, and then come back to this because we we may need to bring a motion to the house to extend the temporary provisions. Is that fair enough? Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. Um, there are no items of correspondence, Emer. Um. And our draft forward work programme is at pages 118 of our PACs. So we agreed at this stage to um, agree our draft forward work programme. Okay. Um, Chairperson's business, you will recall an issue, sorry, an email issued by Emer regarding a visit from the Westminster House of Commons Public Administration and Constitutional Affairs Committee. Ideally, the committee would like to meet with the chairs and deputy chairs of this committee and the executive committee on Monday the 22nd of November at two o'clock in the private dining room. Um, can it not be just Emer all the committee if, there's, if they're inclined or if they've got time? It can be all the committee if they have time. I just need to notify the numbers. Yeah, no worries. I just think the option needs to be given to all. I mean, it, we're all bound by our whips in terms of business in the house, but I think it's something um, that we should go and um, even if it's a representative from each party rather than whatever, people are happy to do that. So if we could let Emer know, um, and that, that meeting has been scheduled for Monday the 22nd of November at 2 o'clock in the private dining room. Okay, um, is there any other items that people want to raise under AOB? 
No, okay. Listen, that was a long committee meeting today. Um, and I'm sure it's been a long day for, for most of us. Emer and Paul and the committee staff, I want to thank you because there was a lot in this pack for this week. A lot of hard work done. So just want to put that on the record and acknowledge it. Um, they didn't. And just a remind, Emer, if you could just send that letter out, reminding people that they need to have their views in for the 24th of November. So without further ado, the date and time for our next meeting will take place on Wednesday, the 1st of December at 2.30. Um, is that agreed? So the meeting's adjourned. So thank you again, everybody. Take care and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Committee room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly.